Thank you, and thank you for that uh, introduction. Yes, I'm uh, Nick Broughton. I'm a, a medic in industry. I've been in industry about 15 years, uh, and I'm interested in ethics and the relationship between ethics and compliance. And one of the uh, founding principles in the business that I run is that you cannot separate ethics from compliance as we have been struggling to do within the pharmaceutical industry, and we do it at our peril. And many of the dumb things that I'm going to talk about are because of that separation of ethics from compliance and ethical thinking from compliance thinking. So this isn't a talk, if you like, about technicalities and technical issues and what the F FPA thinks and the PMCPA thinks and what the law says. This is about concepts and about the ways of thinking and about what I consider to be dumb ways of thinking that get in the way of our activity as an industry as a whole but particularly in the uh, sphere of social media um, and digital uh, activities. In fact, I think it's actually been the revolution in social media that has uh, demonstrated how little we really understood the rules we were operating to. Because we've come into a new area of activity where people are saying, I don't know what to do. But the fact is the rules are there and they are interpretable. Um, but the fact is you have to understand what the rules are and their ethical basis for them. So, five dumb things. Now, the first slide uh, may be, in many people's view, a dumb thing, but this is not one of my five dumb things. This is a, a representation of a Neanderthal. And I think of uh, Neanderthals when I think of some of the people that I train. It's one of the, the beauties of, of training in ethics and compliance is you meet lots of different people and most people are fantastic. Most people get into the spirit of it, they debate, they argue and that's the point of actually a lot of what we do. But now and again you get a Neanderthal and there's one particular Neanderthal that I always think about when I'm thinking about dumb things because he represented to me in one particular training session a few months ago all that was wrong in the way that we, we've been thinking sometimes about compliance and ethics. Because he essentially spent half an hour arguing with me about the fact he should be able to spend £250 on a doctor uh, for a meal and that that shouldn't be a problem because it wouldn't influence his decision. Now the fact is, if you're still operating in that model, if you're still arguing about things that to the rest of the world are obvious, I can't help you. Nobody can help you if you still believe those sorts of things. My argument is to be non-Neanderthal in the digital age, you've got to start thinking about ethics. He was incapable of it. He only saw the bottom line and some compliance barriers. You've got to go further than that. So, my first dumb thing. My first dumb thing is that people say it's so grey. All the rules, they're so grey. Why don't you just make it black and white? And my response to that is, of course it's grey. It's got to be grey. Embrace the grey. We're not arguing, in general, about whether bribery is wrong. We'd all accept that bribing doctors is wrong or lying to doctors is wrong. What we're generally arguing about is, what is a bribe? Is it a sandwich lunch? Is it £25 for lunch? Is it £50 for dinner, with and without wine? Where does the line draw? Where do you draw the line? That's the argument, and that will always be grey. Similarly, what is a lie? When at the point of hiding your uh, side effects and exaggerating your benefits, does it become a lie? You have to make decisions about that. And those things will always be grey, and that's why we have professionals such as you, not just the medical and compliance departments, making those decisions and thinking about those things. And the point is, in grey areas, you have to be able to justify what you do. And that's the bit we've lost by not thinking necessarily about ethical thought processes. We've forgotten how to justify our actions. And in the digital space, when we're in unknown territory, it's less important to some extent what you do, and more important what your justification for it is. And what the argument you're going to put forward to other people is when they come and question what you do or they disagree with you. And that's the skill we've got to regain. So my first dumb thing is people complaining about greyness. And in response to the complaints about greyness, we've had some guidance. People want guidance and there have been, there's been guidance from the PMCPA in the UK as one of the few authorities actually that have given guidance. 
But at the end of the day, it boils down to stuff we should already know. Don't promote to the public. Don't promote outside the license. Be transparent in all you do and honest. Don't lie, essentially. Uh, don't tell fibs. It doesn't really tell you much more than, than, you need, than, than you should already know. And the fact is, and why I particularly rile against people saying we should have more rules, is that I think it levels the playing field too much. To me, actually, it should be a competitive advantage that you can do this stuff well, that you know how to make a good argument for what you do, that you can draw a line and defend it with a good ethical justification. If we make all rules so everybody's equal, then even the idiots will be able to make a success of themselves. I don't think that's a good thing. I think being good at ethics should be a competitive advantage, and that's what I'd drive for. People who think about it are valuable. My next dumb thing, which in truth isn't that, that dumb because it's so common, is the fact that we don't really understand what promotion is as an industry. Now, that's a fairly big statement, but you've seen on that previous slide that you don't promote to the public and don't promote outside the license. And we know from past experience that there are multi-billion dollar fines resting on some of these issues, particularly in the US. So you should know what promotion is. But we don't. We have surveyed companies as part of the, the work we do, where you ask the question, do you know the difference between promotion and non-promotion? And everybody in your survey will say yes. Then you ask them about specific activities, promotional or non-promotional, strongly disagree to strongly agree, and you see a whole range of opinion. And this is not just a range of opinion between companies about what's promotional and what's not promotional. This is a range of opinion that you see within companies. You see within departments within the same companies. You see within departments of people doing the same job within companies that have got differences of opinion, for instance, about whether a press release given to the press uh, about a medicine is a promotional thing. We can't afford that range of opinion about what is promotional. And what it does as well is it leads to confusion about what you can do in the digital space, and particularly in my experience with things like uh, disease awareness campaigns. Because what you, you end up doing is people trying to hide the fact that they might be getting some benefit out of a disease awareness campaign when actually they don't need to hide it. The sort of argument goes that people, uh, people in this uh, thought process have, have is that having a non-promotional aim is impossible. Because any activity that can be expected to benefit a company is promotional. Therefore, we always expect a benefit to the company, or else why else would we do it? So everything's promotional, really. We just pretend it isn't. And you do see that confusion around why people are, for instance, doing disease awareness campaigns. They're trying to hide the fact the company might benefit from it. And what I'm saying is that's not necessary, but you have to be careful about your definition of promotion. And we need to think far more about it. And the tragedy, uh, to some extent, is that there isn't a very good, easy definition of promotion. It's a very difficult thing to get right. If you look in the UK code or the FPA code for a definition, they are pretty lousy. They don't actually really differentiate very well between what is accepted under law as promotional and what isn't. So you need something a bit better. Now, the best um, definition that I've seen, um, and is similar to the one that I'd drawn up is this one from the European Court of Justice. Uh, when they were considering what's called the Damgard case, which is a case of a journalist who was accused of promoting medicines to the public. Um, and he was uh, found to be promoting medicines to the public. But they defined promotion as any information on the availability or the properties of a medicinal product which is intended or may either directly or indirectly influence the behavior of patients or consumers is considered promotional and must comply with the requirements of the community code. In other words, promotion is something to, is those things that we do that try to influence behavior, that set out to try and influence doctors or set out to try and influence patients. It's that act of influencing, of changing behavior. And we have to be quite tight about that definition. Because if we say everything's promotional, as some people do, that dumb thing, if you like, then how do you differentiate between what the law is going to say is promotional and what the law says isn't promotional? And that's a critical thing in these times of, as I say, multiple billion dollar fines. Now, the third thing that um, I'm going to uh, 
relate, and obviously I, I deal in ethics, so to some extent you would expect me to say that ethics is different to compliance. But some people think it's the same thing, and I don't. Um, as an as a interesting aside, there is, uh, I've become aware that there are some people using my... Uh, uh, I've set up ethics, if you like, as, one, as my USP when I'm talking, my um, particular, particular interest. And i found that some compliance agent, people doing compliance tra um, training have, have stolen some of my slides on ethics. Now, how bizarre is that? Um, uh, you know, I'd, I'm... To steal ethical slides, um, I, I would, uh, the, the guy concerned, I, I would um, point out I, how ironic it, it was if, uh, if I thought he understood what irony was. Um, just a little dig. So, compliance is not the same as ethics. Both are essential, but compliance is not the, good compliance is not the same as good ethics. It's possible to, be, to comply well like an East German border guard, but not be ethical by shooting people who are trying to escape your, uh, across, the, across the Berlin Wall. It is not the same. And we've got to see the difference between the two if we're going to act sensibly. Because I'm going to argue to you that your first question about any activity, but particularly in the digital space, is what do I think about it ethically as a human being? Not whether it's compliant, not what the law says, not what Heather Simmons says at the PMCPA, or what the courts have said in the past. What do I think about it as a human being? Because if I can't justify it ethically to myself as a kickoff, I can't go ahead with it. But if I can justify it to myself ethically, then there's a good chance it's going to be compliant. Because compliance rules don't come from nowhere. They come from basic ethical human principles. And if you think it's the right thing to do, Chances are other people will too. So compliance is not the same as ethics. And if there's one thing that I could change about the way we look at all this stuff at the moment, it would be to say to people, don't say, is this compliant when you've got a, an idea or a suggestion, but say to yourself and to others, is this ethical? Is this moral? Now, I've written long lists about the differences between good ethics and good compliance. Um, but I've just chosen about four things here, which I think are particularly pertinent in this environment. The first thing I'd say is that doing nothing is usually compliant. This is the fault of the medical and, market, and, and, sorry, medical and compliance departments, if you like. If you don't do anything, yes, you'll probably be, always be compliant. But will you help anybody? And this is the argument I give to those marketers that I deal with who've got good disease awareness campaigns or patient support program campaigns they want to implement and are finding that they're getting tripped up. If it doesn't happen, if the world isn't a better place because of your, uh, your program, that, that's less ethical if you don't do something. But it will always be compliant not to do things. The second thing is good ethics can justify non-compliance. You have to be able to think about whether what your boss is asking you to do or whether the, what the company is asking you to do is the right thing. That is a safeguard in the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry is not protected by its SOPs, frankly. It's protected by individuals doing the right thing and saying, no, I don't think that's the right course of action. That's my view on it. The other thing is that ethics applies to everything. Compliance only applies to those things that you've written rules about. And in the digital sphere particularly, when we're always thinking up new ideas and new things, it's so critically important that we're able to think uh, and work out what to do when there isn't an obvious course of action, when there isn't a rule written about it. Otherwise, we'll sit on our hands and not achieve anything. But this, to me, is probably the biggest thing, and particularly in the digital sphere, and for particularly for people communicating with the public. Ethical arguments speak to deep-rooted human emotions. They are, ethics is, a, is, if you like, the study of a particular form of human behavior. And it's ethical things that make people passionate, make people argue, make people angry with the pharmaceutical industry and what we do. People out there, the public, don't give us stuff about the code, don't care what the law is. 
If you are wrong in the public eye, you will be judged according to the ethics of the masses. You will not be judged according to whether you've uh, adhered to whichever clause of the code of practice that you happen to be looking at. The point is, you have to be able to argue like a human and think like a human if you're going to be in this space. And to look to uh, codes of practice for the answer is the wrong thing. Ultimately, you see, I think that ethics, or the concept of ethics, links to what often people think as very disparate things. There's been a tendency in the industry to do all our customer-focused thinking over here with the agencies and the clever, imaginative people, uh, and then we sling all the ideas across here to the uh, compliance people and the medics who sort of filter the crap out and you get a bit out the other end. That is a really destructive waste of time uh, to do things. My argument is that actually compliance rules are founded in ethics. They don't come out of nowhere. The reason you can and can't do certain things are based on good, sound ethical principles. But the point is as well that ethics is about, the, is about how you treat other people. You don't get ethical points for being successful as a company or making more money. You get ethical points for considering the harm you do, of bringing benefit to people, of being transparent and honest with people. You get that as a company and as an individual. And so true customer focus is actually ethical. Because you cannot truly be customer focused if you are not ethical. And that is the link between the two things. So truly customer focused work, and particularly if you think of the customer as the patient, will necessarily, is more likely to be compliant. So ultimately, and this is not to say compliance is not important, because it is important to get groups to behave in a particular way. But ethics comes before compliance. And it comes after compliance when the compliance rules run out and don't tell you what to do. You have to be able to think as a human. And here is my sort of uh, shining example, if you like, of somebody I consider to be uh, my medical hero. This is uh, Dr. Frances uh, uh, Kelsey. And she was the um, uh, assessor at the FDA um, when the thalidomide file came across her desk in the early, I think it was the early 60s or end of the 50s. And she was put under untold pressure by uh, the pharmaceutical company, uh, and also by her bosses at the FDA, but she would not let it pass. She personally made the decision not to let it pass because it wasn't right for her. And she saved the lives of thousands of unknown individuals. Okay. The fourth dumb thing. The pharmaceutical industry is evil. Now, you may say, well, I don't think that because I work in it. And that's not unreasonable, but I do think that there is a tendency for us in the industry to be a bit on the ethical back foot. We do let people, attack us, and our ethics and the basis of the industry all the time. As you will know, out there on the web, there are hundreds of people tweeting, writing, blogging about the evils of the pharmaceutical industry. And my view on this is that we, we're, a bit, we're too dumb in the other sense, if you like. We don't talk back enough. We don't defend our moral position well enough or hard enough, and particularly in that digital space. In truth, I think companies haven't responded enough because it perhaps hasn't affected their business enough yet. And I don't think that committees at the ABPI or FPA or whoever else are good at responding to criticism. Response by committee doesn't tend to work. We need individuals and people with, con with ability to write and connect, like yourselves, to respond to the criticisms that we get and defend ourselves against being evil. Now, somebody who, at the moment, is uh, calling us evil on a fairly regular basis is this man. Uh, and for those of you who don't know him. He's a guy called Dr. Ben Goldacre. He writes in The Guardian. I've debated against him once in the, in the distant past, which was wonderful. Um, and he's not dumb, uh, but I do disagree with him. And I've got to disagree with him because he's telling me, essentially, and he has written, as I'll show you in a second, that the pharmaceutical industry is evil. Um, now, if I agree with him, then I've got to leave, morally, I should leave the industry. 
So I've got to disagree with him because I don't want to change my job at the moment. Well, my argument is we've all got to disagree with him and start speaking up about the fact that we're doing the right thing. You see, people like him, whether you know him or not, are very influential on the web. And he's having influence now in the US and, uh, and publishers widely. And he wrote a book, uh, those of you who don't know, called Bad Science, which says quite a bit about the pharmaceutical industry in a couple of chapters. And he makes the statement that uh, big pharma is evil. I would agree with that premise. And that, to some extent, is where he makes his big bloomer, because essentially he makes a premise without any justification and then just throws uh, examples of things to support his premise. And what I want to do over the next few minutes is essentially attack his arguments in that book and give you some of the arguments that you'll need out there to defend what you do and what we all do if we truly believe what we do in the pharmaceutical industry is a world worthwhile thing. And I do, and I'm not prepared to be called evil. So I thought I'd write a few tips for Dr. Goldacre for his next book based on the, what I've read in Bad Science and what he says about the pharmaceutical industry. The first tip is that if you're going to call people evil, that's quite a big thing to say about people, to call people evil. Um, and therefore, you should really define what you mean by evil. It's a fairly basic uh, academic thing. If you're going to make an argument, uh, uh, or you define the terms in it. You can't just wonder about calling people evil, uh, leaving other people to de decide what they mean by that. You can't just mean uh, that things that are evil are, th are people or things that do odd evil things. We all do evil things from time to time. But that doesn't make us necessarily evil. Like my good friend Paul Dixie out there, I mean, uh, he's a good friend, but if I had a premise that uh, he was evil, I'm sure if I looked at everything in his life, I could make a good case to you for him being evil. It doesn't prove the case. And you've got to avoid cherry-picking. Again, you can't just say that the industry is evil and then pick out a load of evil things. That's cherry-picking evidence. We all know how to do that. We've all seen it done at times. But it's not right. And the irony is that Dr. Goldacre in Bad Science criticizes cherry-picking. And yet he cherry-picks all the nasty things that the pharmaceutical industry does to support his prejudice. It's not an academic argument. It's not a good argument. It's a bad argument. The, first, the other thing is to avoid making general claims from specific examples. This is the opposite way around to cherry-picking. And it's a very subtle thing. What Dr. Goldacre does in his book, for instance, he will say something like, some pharmaceutical companies have hidden data from clinical trials. Now, that is undoubtedly true. But the sentence that follows on from that tends to be, pharmaceutical industries hide data in trials. You've made a generalization from something very specific. And that is as ridiculous as saying, some doctors have murdered their patients, which is undoubtedly true. Therefore, doctors murder patients. It's as ridiculous as that. And we should spot work on, on attacking arguments like that. You've got to also, if you're in any academic argument, you've got to recognize good and balance it against the bad. You can't just list bad things and say that the pharmaceutical industry has never done anything good. That would be a ridiculous argument. What about the improvements in cancer survival, just as one, for instance? What about the disappearance of some diseases through vaccination? You can't um, somehow forget the good things. You've got to argue that the bad outweighs the good if you're going to decide we're evil. And none of that happens in bad, uh, bad science. And also, the, probably the main thing is you've also got to avoid double standards. In other words, explain why medical malpractice is less bad than, and less worthy of attention. Are we that much worse than every other industry in existence and of, uh, and, and of all medicine? Why are you concentrating on us particularly? Doubtless we've done bad things in the past, but that doesn't make us uh, unique. And also double standards around things like price. To some extent, we get criticized, and criticized in this book and elsewhere, about the fact that we 
um, essentially want high prices for our medicines. Now, to me, this is not a moral discussion. The fact is, anybody selling something wants the best price they can to make as much money as they can, and the person buying wants to pay the least they can to save as much money as they can. And that's perfectly right. That's normal. That's human behavior. And I don't see any argument, uh, any moral reason why we should step outside that for the pharmaceutical industry. Indeed, I would argue that bad science, when it was published, was doubtly pri doubtless priced at the price that would get the most money for the publishers and for Ben Goldacre. That's how pricing is done. And while we're on price, the price of this book is £8.99. pence. Why do you make anything 99 pence? You do it to try and fool the reader into thinking they're paying eight pounds rather than nine pounds. Now, normally, I don't mind that. But if you're going to wander around the world accusing people of being evil, I don't think you should be doing cheap tricks like that. And the final thing, again, is third world responsibility. We're accused and, and criticized in many places by the fact that we don't help enough the third world. We're not researching enough third world diseases. Now, again, I don't know how much of a moral argument that is. Because the point to me is that we should probably all be doing more for the third world. But I don't see it as particularly a pharmaceutical company industry thing. We're a Western industry for Western diseases, like Western medicine is there to treat Western diseases. People in the third world need power and food and light, but we're not asking Tesco's to go and set up in, uh, in, in the third world. Whether we should all be doing more in the third world is a, is a good moral question that we should debate, but why select the pharmaceutical industry for special treatment? We shouldn't let people get away with this sort of thing. We tend to be too much people's scapegoat. So, just rounding up shortly, Two, oh, two minutes, you're not uh, getting annoyed with me, good. Um, <laughs> integrity. Um, I came across uh, this uh, definition of integrity at a talk yesterday um, that somebody was giving, and I, I, I borrowed it, because it seems to me that people like Dr. Goldacre, people who criticize us, their arguments lack integrity. And, and this is not a criticism of them saying they lack integrity. What it is is a, a criticism of the argument. Because integrity, according uh, to the Wikipedia definition, can be regarded as the opposite of hypocrisy, in that it regards internal consistency as a virtue and suggests that parties holding apparently conflicting values should account for the discrepancy of or alter their beliefs. And so many of the moral criticisms of us as an industry don't do that. They are hypocritical. They lack integrity. Now, the tragedy for all of us is that uh, Dr. Goldacre's next book is already here. It was released earlier this week. It's called Bad Pharma, all right? And it's on release in, in the UK and will also shortly be in the US as well. It's getting interest in the US. Now, I am sure Dr. Goldacre has answered all the criticisms that I have raised about his previous book, which was probably just a bit of a, you know, a, a, a slapdash attempt, because um, clearly it didn't, didn't uh, hold any academic merit. Um, and I'm sure he's addressed that in this book, so I do, but I do recommend that you read it. Um, I'm not altogether confident. It does say how drug companies mislead doctors and harm patients, but you never know. He may have addressed all the flaws in his earlier uh, work. You can buy it at any good uh, bookshop for uh, £13.99. <laughs> the other thing that I sometimes do to amuse myself... Um, is look at, uh, follow this Twitter feed, um, hashtag Big Pharma. It's really good if you want to know just how many paranoid people there are in the world and about the things that you uh, didn't even know you were doing um, as far as evil stuff is concerned. So I would recommend that you uh, follow that. Um, it is interesting. It is interesting about how people look at us uh, and regard us. And my final dumb thing, and to close off, and it's just some, some way coming around in a loop, is that... Somehow ethics are different in the di digital space. They're not. It changes some things about what we are as humans. We perhaps see a bit more of what we're really like. Some of the things that go on. It changes the nature of some harmful things that happen because when people tweet bad things out, it's more harmful than when they shout things out outside a pub. 
It changes the nature of some, some actions, but it doesn't change what we are as humans or what we guard as right and wrong, and that is always going to be your first defense in making any decisions or, or choosing a course of action. So to summarize, it's all so gray, we need more guidance. Not true. Having a promotional aim is impossible. Not true. You need a better definition of, of promotion. I am compliant. I am ethical. Not true. Your ethics is your best defense. It always will be as a human, and that is a natural instinct you have. The pharma industry is evil. No, it isn't, Dr. Goldacre. It's got every much as right to existence as any part of medicine. And ethics are different in the digital space. Not true. Now, as I wrote this list, it seemed to me that if you came back to this, you might think that these were things I was actually saying. So I've left a subtle message in the first letter of every line. <laughs> that it's all shite. Thank you very much. Nick, that yes. was great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we do have questions. Um, while we get, could anyone put their hands up who has a question? Well, while you're thinking about it, do you mind if I ask you one? Yes, minute? you're welcome. I mean, it, from what you were saying, it strikes me that a moral compass is quite a useful tool to have as a, a human being, but also as a farmer marketeer. Do you think the organisations that we work in encourage us and allow us to use that moral compass? No, I don't, I don't believe that we do it, they, they do it sufficiently. Um, if you look at um, just the whole language about the way companies talk about uh, this sort of stuff, we always talk about compliance. And that the first goal of everybody is to comply with the rules. Now... I'm not saying that compliance is wrong. Clearly, you have got to comply with rules. But I'm saying there's a critical element that sometimes we miss, which is to think about the ethics of what you do, as you yourself. Because it's only when you look at the ethics of what you do as well that you'll be able to draw up the justification for your activity. And, and what, what worries me often is that people spend a lot of time in deciding whether we can do something or we can't do it. And they forget their justification for it. And when we go into complex activities and, say, disease awareness campaigns, they're very visible things, and maybe someday somebody will complain about what you're doing. And it's not whether you've done it's the issue, it's what your justification was in your thinking, and often that's been lost. And so I encourage companies to write down that moral justification for their complex, pro complex um, um, uh, activities, if you like because it will get lost with people moving off in different directions around a project if you don't write it down. Um, so we spend too much time thinking about whether we can do something and not why we're doing it and the justification for it. Thanks, Nick. Does anyone on the floor have any questions? Ah, there's a question over here in the, to my left. Hi, Emma Darcy here. Um, that was a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, this is... Um, uh, is a reminder of the furore of a couple of years ago when we had Marcia Angel, um, the ex-editor of New England, uh, writing The Truth About Pharma, and we also had Ray Moynihan publishing in the BMJ um, about the dastardly behaviours of pharma. And to your point about pharma not defending itself, you're absolutely right. There are more than 300 publications a year um, criticising pharma. And as a patient and as someone who works with the medical community, I'm often just completely aghast at, that pharma doesn't defend itself more. Um, actually, the ex-director general of the ABPI wrote a fantastic article a few years ago in which he said it's, it's a bit like the Monty Python scene when you say, what has pharma done for us? What did the Romans ever do for us? Yeah. And that was a great article. Yeah. Um, I'm just concerned that, that what we see, if, if the New England ex-editor is writing these publications and the British Medical Journal is housing publications from anti-industry um, writers, where's the ethics and where's the opportunity for pharma to actually defend itself? I'd just like to know what you think about that. And secondly, um, do we also have a misunderstanding about what disclosure and conflict is um, and, and competing interests? If you look at the writing of, of Tom Stossel, who's a, a really eminent physician at Harvard Medical School, uh, he's actually had, he's, he's had no uh, presence, really. He's had no publication, but he's writing from the, the fact that we misunderstand what, what declaration of conflict of, of interest is. 
that a bit like we misunderstand what, what promotion is, we misunderstand what declaration of conflict is, and it's not designed to you know, point out your relationships with pharma, it's designed to, to disclose and be transparent. And there's a misunderstanding there, I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Um, what was the first point again? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, just what you think about the fact that the anti-industry yeah, publishers have all the airspace. I think that, you know, we have got a lot of, uh, we are a, a communications industry to some extent, and I think that there is nothing to stop us um, having a better voice. But the, the, the issue, I think, goes back to a little what I was saying earlier. We tend to, re, re, you know, respond by committee. Um, and also companies by themselves tend not to respond. Nobody sticks their head above the, the parapet. Either the companies think, are, are sort of apathetic about it and think, well, it's not really affecting business sort of thing, we'll just carry on. Um, and, and the industry associations think they have to reply by committee, and that is not a great, great way to respond because what you're doing when you, you, you point to the people who criticise is you're talking about individuals. And, and an individual making a point rapidly and quickly and passionately is far more effective than a committee responding two months later after a round of votes about which particular word to put in. And we need more individuals to stand up and be writing and passionately writing about what we do and defending what we do. That, that's my view, because we have the, the means to communicate it, I think. Uh, on the point of, of, of transparency, um, I, I, to, to me, the, the principle of transparency is one of, uh, it's a, based on a principle of ethics, the re principle of respect for autonomy, res respecting people's freedom to make good, de right decisions. And, and so transparency, uh, I tend to think, is, is about making people aware of things that, that might have influenced a, a writer or a speaker in what they say. Whether it has influenced them or not doesn't matter. So to me, it is just to say we, you know, we have a, a relationship. And the, the thing I often like about the farmer industry, you know, people criticise us for our involvement in things, but actually we are pretty transparent now. And frankly, you know, if we've got a message, take it or leave it. You know our agenda. We're trying to sell our drug. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's, our, that's our job. You know our agenda. There's so many other people out there writing about medicine and their opinions on things. You don't know what their agenda is. At least you know ours if we're transparent. 